Okay. So let me maybe just briefly, let me quickly go over a refresher of artificial neural networks. So in a graphical format, typically people draw artificial neural networks like this. You have layers. So there's like input layer, uh, output layer, and then the middle one in between the input and output is called the hidden layer. And uh, uh, each of these circles is called a neuron. Uh, again, these are all analogy with uh, physical, biological neural networks. And the, the 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 key artifact of a neural network that allows it to do things is the the connection between neurons. So between different layers, you have connections, and each connection will uh, have a, a strength, a number associated to it. So for example, like uh, a, a connection here has strength two, so that means that like uh, a an activation of order one on this neuron will trigger and uh, will pull this this target neuron toward the positive side by uh, by unit two, two being one times two. And then whereas here, this negative four, it means that when this neuron activates, it inhibits this neuron. It makes it be, uh, become negative. So negative two activation uh, uh, with a negative four strength here will make this positively ac activated in uh, by order eight. So so in words, uh, this uh, linear combination uh, of activations using the, these weights cause a what's called a pre-activation of order 10 here being one times two plus negative four times negative two. Um, and then finally the actual uh, activation of this neuron uh is is the result of this number 10 mapped through some nonlinear function typically or well, classically of the sigmoidal shape but nowadays uh it can be like you know like a relu which is kind of like a um i don't know like a like like this but it can be any really any nonlinear function in artificial neural networks and so when you do these calculations, propagating some signal in the input layer, the signal being one, three, negative two, a vector of uh, sh uh, shape three here, uh, it, prop it propagates into the hidden layer by some linear combination via the weights and then some corner-wise nonlinearity through this function phi, uh, nonlinear function phi. And then it propagates and propagates in the same way uh, to the output. Um, and some terminology here. So in each layer, there are a number of neurons. The number of neurons in a layer is called the width. So in this hidden layer, there are four neurons. Uh, in the output layer, there are two neurons. In the input layer, there are three neurons. And then the number of layers is called depth. So in this case, uh, uh, in some, so so maybe let me just say that depth in the literature, you can, it, it, there's like a little discrepancy in how people use depth because sometimes you only count hidden layer. So in that case, this is one, depth equals one here. Other people count uh, input and output layer, in which case it's three. Some some people count the number of uh, connections between layers, in which case, case it's two here because there are two sets of connections. Um, but in any case, depth in general is uh, the number of layers. However, you want to count the layers is, is at most off by two. Uh, from how other people use it. Anyway, so width and depth are the most uh, two most important uh, numbers describing the size of the neural network, width being the number of neurons in the hidden layer and depth being the number of layers uh, in the neural network. Okay, so this is what a kind of grown neural network looks like in the sense of like, you know, what, what a final form of neural network looks like. But the beauty of this thing, the, the reason we care about it nowadays is because it's a very efficient way of learning a pattern from data. And the way you, you learn is by kind of slowly modifying these connections to fit some kind of pattern. Um, so this process of slowly changing the connections to fit some pattern uh, the pattern being some kind of you know function from input to output uh, is called gradient descent. So uh, this is a very very old method, you know, dating back to 200 300 years ago, um, where essentially if you have a you know smooth function, and like 
here you think of like the y-axis is like the number of mistakes or some measure of badness. So, so the higher the number is, the worse you want it to be. So you want to minimize this this badness uh, number. And uh, because the function is smooth, what you can do is always look at the direction. Uh, if you're if you're here, for example, you can look at the direction of greatest descent and take a step in that direction. Um, so that's why it's called gradient descent because you're always looking to minimize uh, this this badness measure by taking a step uh, toward uh, the direction that will minimize locally this badness measure. And when you do this many, many steps, you know, in good scenarios, you will converge to the global minimum. But uh, in general, that's not guaranteed. But at least you, you will minimize the function in some some way. Might not be a global minimum, but usually it's a local minimum. Uh, again, so this relates to how um, we, we uh, talk about what we talked about earlier with neural networks in the way that, you know, again, you try to minimize um, the error between the function represented by this neural network, this function being, you know, you, you push some input through the input layer, you do the computation in the middle, and then you get some numbers in the output. And so you, this function represented by neural network, you want to minimize the error, the discrepancy between this represented function and uh, the, the unknown function represented by data. So again, the way you, you arrive at this, you try to learn this pattern, is by starting from some initial set of weights. This is called the initialization. And you try to change them over uh, over many steps iteratively uh, by, by looking at the gradients of these weights uh, with respect to uh, the, the discrepancy measure between the representative function and the target function. And then you, you take a gradient step in the space of weights. Uh, so as to locally minimize uh, this discrepancy. Okay, so you're so if you look at this picture, the x-axis is the space of weights, and y-axis is the kind of like discrepancy measure, or it's also called loss, which is the the canonical name for this discrepancy measure. And uh, so so you would take many many steps in the direction of minimizing uh, this loss or this discrepancy until you um, learn the pattern, right? So so there are two numbers, uh, two sets of numbers that are very, very important uh, for, for deciding what to do in this algorithm. So there is the initialization, which is where do you start in this picture? So in this picture, you, you start here, right? So you have to take a couple steps to get the minimum, but if you somehow knew uh, the, the perfect, uh, like the, the minimizer, then you could have started here, and then you will be done to start with. You don't have to do any work, right? So, so in some sense, you know, if you the closer you can initialize to the minimizer value, uh, the better, uh, the faster this algorithm would run. The second set of numbers that are very important is the learning rate. So this is how large a step do you take at each step. So for example, here, you know, in this picture, you take, you know, small, small steps until you get to the minimum. So you took maybe like 10 steps here, but you could have taken like the perfect size, which is like, you know, a rather large step from here to here, and then you will be done in one step. But of course, you know, in general, you don't know a priori how far you are from the minimum. Uh, so it's it's a trade-off where if you take small steps, you're guaranteed to, to uh, to to eventually get to the minimum, but if you take large steps, you can potentially overshoot. So if you take a very large step, you can overshoot to the other side of this hill, um, and then you will never get to your minimum. Okay. Um, so again, there are two sets of numbers, initialization and learning rate, and you can potentially define the initialization and learning rate for every connection, uh, every weight value, in the uh in the neural network right so so it's potentially a large number uh of what we call hyperparameters these are hyperparameters because there are uh kind of um 
kind of meta uh, numbers, you have to decide uh, on how you uh, how you should carry out the algorithm to learn the hidden pattern rather than the underlying uh, weights of the neural networks themselves. Okay, so hopefully this is a good brief refresher for everybody. Okay, now let's get to the main story at hand. So suppose you got a hold of a time machine and somehow you went back to 1969 when uh, John F. Kennedy said, uh, let's go to the moon. But actually your uh, time machine brought you to the Soviet Union and Stalin was like, uh, we're gonna get to the moon first. But your time machine malfunctioned. So somehow in your timeline, you actually don't have Newton. Um, so nobody knows how gravity works. And again, your mission is to get the Soviet Union to the moon before the Americans do without Newton. Well, fortunately, you remember that in, in high school, there's this thing called uh, the universal gravity equation, which says something like force due to gravity is, you know, some mass one times mass two over radius squared times some unknown uh, number that you don't remember exactly. So you, you, you're like, okay, like, what can I do with this? And Stalin was very encouraging. And he was like, uh, you know, the, the, the great Soviet Union will uh, support you in your, in your trial and error. You can shoot as many rockets as you want to the moon. And as you want, the great uh, Soviet workers will, will willingly sacrifice themselves for for the 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 achievement of landing on the moon so you're like okay i mean if you say so so you're like uh okay let me say let me guess this number is probably like six so you um plug in six for uh newton's constant and you devise a lot of of um the whole machinery of rocketry and you made your shot, but you missed. So uh, everybody died and you kind of wasted a few billion dollars. Uh, but Stalin was like, okay, no worries. You know, there will be next batch of great Soviet workers for you to leverage. So you guessed seven for the uh, Newton's constant. Again, unfortunately, it wasn't correct still. So you still missed the moon uh, by some distance. But because you know the Soviets have a lot of manpower and uh, industry, you were able to eventually get it down to an accurate enough number, six point six seven four blah blah, uh, until you actually landed on the moon. Okay, so you achieved your uh, objective, but at the cost of a lot of money, time, energy, and manpower. But Let's suppose if Newton was actually in your timeline, then Newton would say gravitation is universal. You don't have to guess this number by you know trying uh, to shoot to the moon. This number is the same on the moon as it is on Earth. So you could have measured this gravitational constant on Earth uh, and use that number uh, when you try to calculate the trajectory to the moon. So you don't have to waste all this amount of money, energy, time when you could have just done a very small uh, scale experiment on Earth and get this number accurately enough and redo your uh, rocketry, right? Okay, so so this story sounds a little bit farcical because who would actually you know, shoot rockets to the moon to figure out Newton's gravitational constant? That's just absurd. But... This is really not that far from how uh, these large uh, language models like ChatGPT are trained today. So in this analogy, shooting to the moon is like training for the next GPT model. Say like GPT-9000 is a huge, huge model. And each trial of shooting your rocket to the moon is like a training run of a neural network. And each such run can take months at a time to accomplish. Um, and these crucial numbers, this Newton's constant, in this case, is analogous to these hyperparameters 
that I discussed earlier, like learning rate initialization uh, of your model that governs how uh, yeah, how the, the exact details of uh, how your algorithm, your gradient descent will run. And they will have very large effect on how uh, on the quality of your model in the end and how fast you can train. So in this analogy, whereas Newton says gravitation is constant, is universal, uh, I am saying the hyperparameters are universal. And whereas Newton will tell you that you can measure the gravitation constant on Earth uh, and have it apply anywhere in the universe, I say that you can measure these uh, hyperparameters on a very small model and be able to reuse them on arbitrary large neural networks. Okay, so that's the gist of this whole thing. So the the technique here is called maximal update parameterization, and we abbreviate this as the MUP. Uh, so first of all, this is something you can use today uh, by doing pip install MUP if you use PyTorch. So it's not anything abstract. It's something very very concrete that you can touch today. It's a principal way of scaling initialization and learning rate with the width of the model. Again, the width being the number of neurons of a neural network, uh, backed by some beautiful mathematics I'll try to convey in this talk. Uh, and it's described in short by this table here, but don't worry about what it says. What I just want to convey here is that it's really a very simple description in the end, almost like an E equals MC squared, but uh, slightly more complicated. Um, so nothing to be afraid of on the theoretical front either. Now, the, the reason we like this mu p is that it has these two properties called hyperparameter stability and larger is better. So to illustrate uh, what, what these properties mean, let me first talk about what is going on currently before uh, this technique. So the way people do things uh, it's called uh, this this thing called standard parameterization, where they scale uh, things in a particular way. They scale learning rate initialization in a particular way uh, as the model size becomes large. And you can do the following experiment with your favorite model. You can try to you know train the model and vary uh, a hyperparameter, say like learning rate on the x-axis, and you plot the training performance on the y-axis. So the larger, the better. Then you, you typically see a curve like this, where you know the optimal region of hyperparameters uh, is you know somewhere like this, it maximizes the performance. Okay, so this curve this this curve will look fairly typical, but as you scale the model up, increase the width, uh, you see something like this, where you can notice there are some interesting and undesirable patterns happening. One is that as you make your model larger, the the region of optimal hyperparameter is shifting. In this case, shifting to the right, but you can shift to the left in other circumstances. So, you know, if you were to to stick with uh the best hyperparameter in the smallest model, you would do you know fairly poorly for the for the largest model. And secondly, when you scale up the model, you're not guaranteed to increase the performance of your model. So, for example, if you fix this hyperparameter, right, like this vertical slice, and then you just look at these darker and darker curves, which corresponds to larger models, then you see that the, the performance is actually not monotonic. Eventually, your performance actually decreases. Similarly, if you optimize over all hyperparameters, you just look at the peak of each curve, you'll still see uh, non monotonic behavior. So this is a violation of these two properties, hyperparameter stability, which is violated by this, the, the optimal region shifting. And secondly, it violates larger is better because you know in many different senses, larger models do not actually give you better performance. Okay, so now we can talk about mu p. So if you were to just swap out the standard parameterization, what people do by default with this maximal all the parameterization I briefly described earlier, uh, then you'll see that all the problems are fixed. The optimal hyperparameter is stable as you increase it with the model. You always gain some performance when you increase uh, the model size. 
Um, okay, so with this in mind, it's you know very very obvious what the next step is. You should never directly tune your large model because you know, like I said, each model can cost uh months to train and you know cost on the order of like ten to hundred million dollars for each training run. So you cannot just try, you know, a hundred different combinations and see which one sticks. That's way, way too expensive. Instead, um, using this insight that maximum other parameterization preserves uh, the optimal hyperparameter as you increase the width of the model, you can just shrink the model to a very small size, tune this uh, small model. You can try all the all kinds of different combinations you want on the small model, and then just copy the hyperparameters from the small model to the large model. But of course, like the caveat here is you have to scale the hyperparameters correctly using MUP to convert the hyperparameters of small model to hyperparameters of large model. So this is in, in the analogy before, this is kind of like, instead of directly shooting your rocket to the moon by guessing Newton's constant, which is way too costly that nobody would ever in their right mind do this, you invoke Newton instead and say, okay, let's, you can just measure the gravitational constant on earth. You know, just, you can, you know, like shake the apple tree and get as many apple down as you want and measure their, their acceleration and use that number, right. To, to guide your, uh, uh, plan to shoot the moon. So everything I've said here, uh, we validated this on real models on a wide, uh, in a wide ranging scale. So from MLP on CFAR10, which is, which is a very small scale, like a toy model size, all the way to GPT-3, 6.7 billion parameter model in collaboration with OpenAI. And in general, we find there are two remarkable trends uh, with this technique. So first, when we take these you know existing models, uh, which were previously hand tuned, kind of like like people essentially you know just did this with with their models, because they didn't really know any better. They just tried a couple uh, hyperparameters, i.e. Newton's constant, and they they just just see what happens and which one sticks. That's what people did before. So for all these models, there were these baselines that were just hand tuned. Uh, neural networks. We take these hand-tuned models and we retune them, right? research the hyperparameters uh, for these models using this uh, mean transfer technology, where we shrink the model first and then we uh, we tune the small model and we test it on the large model. Um, so when you do this, we compare against the baseline. We see that the improvement against this this hand-tuned baseline. This baseline without the right mathematics, we see the improvement actually is increasing as the model size becomes larger and larger. So in some sense, what this says is that people are worse and worse at guessing the hyperparameters, guessing the Newton's constant when the target, you know, uh, target model size, the target cost of uh, training these models gets larger and larger. And this makes sense because you know, like you have to extrapolate the, the human has to extrapolate more and more from their limited experience with small models to these large models as the large models get larger. Okay, so again, the first trend we see here is that you have more improvement due to mu transfer as the model size becomes larger. The second is that the cost of doing this procedure, tuning the model decreases to zero as a fraction of the total training cost as the model size becomes larger. And the reason here is that this the, the theory here guarantees that when you when you tune your model on this shrunken model, this shrunken model can stay a constant size as the target model size goes to infinity. So the so essentially in this fraction of tuning cost versus training cost, the tuning cost stays constant, whereas the training cost goes to infinity as the target model becomes larger and larger. As a result, this fraction goes to zero. Concretely, when we look at this uh, GBD, GBD3 6.7 billion parameter model, 
we affected double the model size compared to the previous hand-tuned baseline of GPT-3. Uh, and the, the fractional cost of, of retuning the neural network is only 7% of the total training cost. Right, so this is already getting to very, very negligible territory. Um, so this is as close to a free lunch as you can get. And of course, you have to do the right mathematics to get the free lunch. And this is the same thing with Newton's law or Maxwell's equations. You have to do the math to be able to get that free lunch. Okay, so now let's see what is the math involved here. So the plan here is to tell you what actually mu p is. And I'll try to do that um, to give you as much intuition as possible here without diving too much into the deep learning details. And then I'll talk about like how this was derived in the first place. And there's a very beautiful mathematical theory behind this. Um, and then I'll conclude from there. Okay, so because this this uh, I assume this audience is not you know terribly familiar with uh, like the details of neural networks, to convey the most intuition is easier is easiest perhaps to give you uh, a mathematical analogy that captures the spirit of what is being done uh, in in the in the work here. So, okay, so let's play a game. So I have uh, n numbers, w1 to wn, sampled independently from uh, a standard Gaussian with mean zero and variance one. And I define this quantity, this random quantity, uh, z sub n of c as a function of c to be just the sum of these wi's multiplied by this number c, okay? Now let's consider some like you know, double double well function. It can be anything really, but like just for concreteness, let's take this double well function, a quartic, defined by this equation here. You can think of it in physics analogy like an energy function, uh, if you will. And the question is, uh, the the quest here is to find the minimal minimizer c star that minimizes the expected value of uh, the the energy of this number. So you can think of this number as some like, you know, distribution of particle on the X axis or the Z axis here. And I wanna minimize the energy of, of this guy, right? So it's the expected value of F of this guy. Okay, so first question, how does C star of N scale with N? Again, N is the number of the WIs here that you're summing up inside of the Z sub N. Okay. Uh, anybody, yeah, feel free to shout it out. I'm just gonna wait here until somebody says something. No idea. <laughs> All right, that doesn't count, come on, man. <laughs> All right, who, who, I'm just gonna go through the audience. Oh, somebody said something on on chat actually. Uh, one over square root of n. Yeah, yeah, great. So Sadia Zahor. So that's that's correct, All right? So C star of n should scale like one over square root of n as n becomes large. Um, and the reasoning here is really quite straightforward. So this this function does not change with n. Right, it's the same function as n changes. So the minimizer of this function, you know, better like say roughly the same with n in terms of scale. But you can notice that z n of sub c, uh, the scale uh, of this quantity for fixed c will scale like square root of n. Right, but this is basic probability because like the variance. Yeah, the mean is zero, exactly. The mean is zero. Uh, the variance scale like n, exactly. So variance of each term is one. So the var the variance was sum. So the variance is n. So that the standard deviation is square root of n, right? So this quantity 
given fix C was scale like square root of N. So, so in order to have you know the input to F be a constant scale, you want to scale C like one or square root of N so that the Z term, this whole Z thing is of constant scale, right? You can of course do you know some further calculation to show that okay exactly one of screw n is actually correct, but you know we don't care about the exact number here, just how it scales with n. So in the pictorial format, you can plot this equation uh, as follows, where x-axis is log c star, y-axis is log n, so that like this this scaling relation of one of screw n plus like a straight line. Um, with the with the slope of like I guess two neg negative two in this case, but the point being that when you double n, right, you want to uh divide c by square root of, square root of two, right? Okay. Now second question. Uh, but great job, uh, Sadia Zahor. Uh, one brownie point for you. So the second the second game. Uh, is almost the same, except for that the mean now is non-zero. So WI, for example, from Gaussian would mean one and variance one. Okay. ZN is defined the same way as before, and you know everything else is the same. But I, now I ask the same question, how does C star N scale with N? I, I'm just gonna pause here until somebody says something. Could it be one over N so that the Law, law of large numbers helps. So uh, that's, that's, correct. Constant. that's correct. Yeah. One brownie point for Viet. All right. So we have a competition here between Viet and Zahor. Sadia Zahor. So, yeah, the, the reasoning here, again, is the same as before. Uh, except for now, there's a competition between the central limit effect and the law of large number effect. So the reason being that, you know, suppose, you know, now let's let's think of like this variance as zero instead of one, right? Then in this case, this sum of n elements is literally n. Like there's no fluctuation. It's literally n, right? So this thing will scale like n, like linear in n instead of square root in n, which is the previous case where we have a zero mean and some, some variance. Now, when you add the variance one back, the only thing that changes is that you have a fluctuation of order square root of n. Okay. So you have a, a essentially deterministic component, which is order n and a fluctuation of square root of n. So the deterministic component of n dominates, right? So like this thing will, will essentially scale like uh, when you fix C as n increases, Z sub n will scale linearly in n. Right, and just like before, to minimize this energy function, because this function is not changing with n, the minimizer must be you know something that's of constant order. So to make z n constant order, you want to divide this sum by order n. So c should be uh, on the order of one over n. Again, you can do some more calculation to get this constant to be like something like square root of three, but you know don't worry about this. So when you plot this scaling relation of one over n, you're gonna get this pattern, right? Where now when you increase n by factor two, you decrease c star by factor two, right? Okay, so final final part of the game, a little bit more difficult. So you have two sets of numbers now, wi and vi. They're sample from uh. Uh, a mean zero Gaussian and mean one Gaussian. So essentially it's the same, these two sets of number, uh, but we put them together now. They're all independent. And then I let Zn of C to be equal to the max of these two numbers. All right, so so like, so like essentially you have the Zn's from before, but I take the max of these two numbers. And so there are, C now stands for two numbers, C1 and C2. You can still ask for C star, which is again, two numbers, a set of two numbers. How does C star N scale with N? So you should tell me kind of like how C1 and C2 star, uh, scale with N. This one's easy to guess though. 
you know this is recorded right like <laughs> you, you, your silence is going to be recorded to posterity okay okay I'll, I'll i'll blot out the answer the answer is the obvious one it's the one that essentially combines uh these two answers and the the intuition here is that whenever there's a nonlinear function like the max here it really doesn't matter that much you can't have like arbitrary nonlinear functions in general the inputs to nonlinear functions should always be uh, order one um, in order to ensure an order one output. I just just for the simple reason that you know typically nonlinear functions have an effective range which is constant. So essentially, it's the same uh, same kind of argument as before, and when you combine them, you get this one over square root of n on the first number, one over n on the second number. Okay, so having played this game, the point of this is to give you kind of the core intuition, like kind of role play what it feels like to do the mathematics behind uh, scaling neural networks. So the, in this analogy, these WIs are like weights in a neural network uh, connection. Uh, somebody asked what is data? Data is the big O notation. It just means like asymptotically, like this, like this is like an expression that asymptotically scales like one over square root of n. Yeah, not big, not small. Um, so uh, yeah, so these WIs are like weights, and the number of them is is like the width of the neural network, right? So let me just remind you, right? This is what a neural network looks like. Width is the number of neurons. So when you look at, you know, like the the a neuron in the output layer, for example there are width number of neurons feeding into this neuron, which all have like a summation effect on the output of this neuron before the uh, the nonlinear function. So um, so this is uh, analogous to weights. Uh, the summation is analogous to the summation process in calculating the pre-activation of a neuron. Um, and then like these different sets of numbers correspond to weights from different parts of your network, like here you have input layer, you have output layer. They act like, you know, they, they act in sequence, but they are independent parts of the neural network. And these CI, C1, C2 are like hyperparameters, like the learning rate and the initialization we talked about earlier are determines how large certain things are. And like this Z is kind of like uh, the training result, like the resulting neural network after training. And then this f is like the loss function that, that tells you like how how much discrepancy is there between the pattern hidden in data and the pattern that your neural network has learned. And the c star looks like uh, it is analogous to the optimal hyperparameter you're interested in to optimize the process of training neural network. Okay. Yeah. So again, this is the picture. Uh, of a neural network, hopefully everything fits into uh, f uh, all the puzzle pieces fit together in your mind at this point. And Greg, and I, just, sorry, your question. If you just go back to your slide with the um, the other one that you just were on with it. So the particular, I mean, it's a little bit confusing that you take like a very specific shape of loss function, but you just want anything that is like a well that blows up away from zero, no? Yeah, so uh, so almost, in a, like the other one is uh, like in this particular example, I don't actually want the minimizer to be at zero. Then like all the answer degenerates, you can just set C to be zero. Uh, so I actually want something non-trivial. So like the minimizer must be away from zero. Which is like realistic, you know, like otherwise you can just set all your ways to be zero in the neural network and you're done. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but it's off, like the other obvious feature is, as you said, you know, like the things, uh, like when the new, the, up, the, the output of the neural network is super large, that should be bad. Like it should be kind of, you know, within some range. Okay, so let me try to talk a little bit about the, uh, the mathematics behind this. Oh, let me let me say like this is the this is the picture uh, the table you saw at the very beginning of what mu p is. Um, again, like let me just say a bit more about this uh, than before. 
but I won't be able to explain all the details. So the rows are the different hyperparameters, which are like C star in the previous example. They're like initialization, uh, the learning rate for different algorithms of uh, gradient descent. And uh, the columns here are different parts of the neural networks. So like it turns out you need to scale things differently for different parts of the neural network, which is kind of like the lesson here. You know, this is like the middle layer of the neural network, this is like the input layer. And you had to, you had to scale things differently for different parts of the neural network. Uh, and um, the, the entries here are scaling relations. They tell you, you know, like fan in and fan out here are uh, different notions of width. So one over fan in tells you that when fan in doubles, you should, uh, you should, you should half the initialization variance here. Anyway, so so this table, I think having the context of our discussion now, you should be able to kind of read it and like take a few minutes and grok it, but I won't do it here. Okay, so now let me try to talk about some of the really nice mathematics behind this. So first of all, we talked about this term parameterization for a while now. In general, it's just a way of filling this table. Like, how do you scale the learning rate? How do you scale the variance of uh, the initialization? Like, usually the way you fill this table is as a power of width. So, you know, for example, like, you know, like you can choose exponents like B1, B2, B3, you know, C1, C2, C3, so on and so forth. Uh, uh, and, and any choice of these BI and CIs will give you a parameterization, which tells you how do you scale these um, hyperparameters uh, as the width becomes large. So just like the picture we drew before in that uh, in that game we played, you can uh, pictorially think of these parameterizations as these uh, arrows pointing toward infinite width. So in this picture, we have hyperparameters on the x-axis and width on the log width on the y-axis, which is analogous to the previous uh, game we played. And, you know, so if you draw this and you draw the whole high dimensional space of hyperparameter on the x-axis, which is now we're doing here literally, but figuratively we're doing that, then you'll see some kind of, you know, like flow, uh, some direction, some rays pointing some direction from UP and then SP, for SP, the standard parameterization, you will point some other way. And in general, you can think of these parameterizations as flows of hyperparameter with respect to width. So just like, you know, a flow like with water, you know, water is a, is a, is a flow, is the traversal of water particle uh, across time. Here, you can think of the same thing where like hyperparameter is like the, the space, like the spatial dimensions. And width is kind of like time. And then like parameterization is essentially like a way to push uh, your uh, hyperparameters as if they're particles, you know, as time increases. So it's kind of like some kind of force that pushes the hyperparameters in a certain direction as width becomes large. Now, having defined such a flow, which is a way to kind of, you know, like let when you let time go to infinity, like, you know, a particle will follow uh, this kind of parameterization as if a particle in water, in a stream of water, following some flow. Now you can define the limit as width goes to infinity. Just like, you know, how you can define, you can, how you can ask the question of like, if you let time go to infinity, where is this water particle? So because we have these different kinds of parameterizations, uh, like the standard way people are doing it right now is a particular kind of parameterization. So it's a particular kind of flow of hyperparameters. So so this when you take this kind of limit, a neural network would tend to have a certain kind of behavior. Uh, you know, I won't go into detail here, but it will have some kind of kernel behavior. Again, I won't explain what that means, but it will have some, some kind of behavior that is very distinct from uh, finite neural networks. You can also take another uh, parameterization like mu p, and that will give you a different kind of limit, and you behave in a very different way than the limit here. And likewise, there are many, many different kinds of parameterizations because, like in this picture here, you know, you can pick any real numbers b1, b2, b3, so on and so forth, and that would de define direction to go to infinity. 
And when you travel to the end of the rainbow, you'll find a different kind of infinite width in your network. Um, and they all have very different behaviors between each other. But in any case, like what I'm saying here is really at the, at the very uh, core of it is something very simple, which is that any parameterization uh, is bijective with uh, infinite width neural network, right? So parameterization defines a way to take an infinite width limit that gives you infinite width neural network. Conversely, to get a limit, you need to define how do you take the limit, and that's exactly uh, what a parameterization is. So in the pictorial uh, way we represented things, like parameterization is like the slope here, and then like the infinite width neural network is the end of the rainbow. Um, and uh, just like in the game before, the parameterization, this slope here is uh, essentially the, the scalings of the different numbers we have, like the one over square root of n in the first uh, example of the game, and then one over n in the second example of the game. And these you know correspond to very different behaviors of uh, sums, right? Like the central limit behavior, when we have zero mean and the deterministic behavior for a large, large number uh, without without zero mean. Okay, so our discussion began with the question, how do optimal hyperparameters scale with width, right? And a reasonable guess uh, is that any optimal way of scaling these uh, hyperparameters should follow some kind of polynomial law like this. Right, like you know, these the the scaling relation will look something like when you double width, you should you know like half your uh, initialization or something like that, right? So 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 for some choice of bi and ci, like the, these should be the optimal way of scaling your hyperparameters. And we just saw that there's this bijective relation between any scaling, any parameterization, and uh, the infinite width neural network resulting from that parameterization. So you should then realize that if you do follow the optimal way of scaling hyperparameters, when you reach this infinite width limit, the, li the limit must be optimal in some way. Okay, I'll, I'll say a bit more about what this means, what optimal means here. But maybe the converse statement here is that if you, if you, if you have a proposed way of scaling hyperparameters and you take the infinite width limit and the limit is suboptimal in some way, then obviously for large enough width, like the hyperparameters, uh, the way you scale hyperparameters must be wrong because you have entered a region where the, uh, the hyperparameter that you arrived at is suboptimal. So part of the philosophy here, part of the observation here is that if you don't do things correctly, when the model is small, okay, you can maybe hide this, you know, suboptimality, uh, you know, in in other parts of the training procedure. But when you let width goes to infinity, any small defects of the training procedure, like suboptimal setting of learning rate, for example, gets magnified to infinity, and that that causes a kind of like a zero one law behavior, where like some some structural changes happen in the neural network that, that makes it obviously suboptimal. Okay. So so if you know about probability, like zero one law where, you know, like in uh, in material science, there's like um, kind of like this, where like, you know, in IC models, there's like Curie temperature and stuff like that. Anyway, I, I, let, me, let me not throw out random terms. Um, but this is summarized by this thing called optimal scaling thesis, which tells you how the auto infinite width limit uh, that it tells you how the auto infinite width limit tells you exactly how the optimal hyperparameters scale. And this is how exactly this mu p thing came about. The way it came about is that I did the mathematics and I was able to uh, completely classify all possible infinite width limits. And in in this set of limits. There was one that's obviously optimal, and the one the other ones are not uh, are obviously suboptimal. And uh, as a result, I was able to identify the right way to scale the hyperparameters by backtracking, kind of like back away from infinity. So this is 
the, the rough picture of what the space of all possible infinite with neural network looks like. Uh, but I have one minute left. So let me summarize and we can come back to this if people are interested in asking questions. Okay, so this is just to conclude. So I started talking about Newton's laws. Uh, and let me end by talking about, you know, 21st century physics. So in the state of 21st century physics, we know there are four fundamental forces so far that governs our universe. So gravity, electromagnetism, weak nuclear and strong nuclear force. And we have two very successful mathematical models that has spun off so much, you know, work in pure mathematics. It's crazy. So one is standard model, which... Uh, you know, to the best of our abilities, explain almost everything about these three forces. And then there's Einstein's general relativity, which explains gravity. But of course, everybody also knows that the theory, everything that connects these two models, that explains everything in between these these forces, is still missing. And that's still one of the holy grails of physics. Now, in new networks, we also have fundamental forces. We have width, depth, training time, batch size, so on and so forth. These are ways in which we scale our systems, our intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence systems. And you know, today I gave you uh, a brief overview of the mathematics that goes on behind uh, analyzing large width new networks and deriving fundamental insights about how they scale. And this is a framework called tensor programs, a theoretical framework called tensor programs. I did not really talk about today the the, the really uh, um, nitty gritty details of the theory, but this is the underlying framework that enabled everything. So whereas tensor programs is able to give you a fairly good understanding of width, uh, the question, the same question regarding these notions of you know, fundamental forces of deep learning, they're much, much less studied. And it's not even clear if they're fundamental scaling dimensions. Like for example, you know, just like electricity and mechanism were unified in the 19th century by Maxwell, it's not even clear whether these are really, you know, fundamental or not. So right now, at the cusp of a new um, kind of intelligence, in our human civilization, it's a perfect time to look for a theory of everything for large scale deep learning that tells us how to scale our models uh, across all of these different uh, fundamental forces of deep learning and to find other ones that were missing. And, and these will tell us, for example, how to scale uh, the optimal hyperparameters as you increase the model sizes how do you allocate your resources across width, depth, training time, and so on and so forth? And you know other things that uh, aren't being considered right now. And if you believe in this optimal scaling thesis I talked about before, then the role of a the theoretician, of a mathematician is actually very clear. So the roadmap is that you take infinite size limits where size comes from any of these candidates and you classify all the possible limits and from this classification, you should be able to find the optimal limit. And if you can do this, then you can profit immediately from this mathematics. It's really something you, you can ship into the model the next day. And this is maybe quite unique in, in the sense that, like at least in deep learning, it's very rare to see any kind of direct connection between theoretical advance and empirical advance like we see here. And of course, taking limits and classifying objects are you know, things that mathematics is really good at. So I have high hopes that everybody in the audience will make significant progress on this problem in the next year. Again, this is this talks reported, right? So like, you know, this 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 is uh, very much a promise written in stone. Anyway, so I'll stop here. Uh, the paper is uh, as here given by the QR code. And again, you can uh, play with MuP today by doing pip install MuP. You can also go to the GitHub and look at the, the code itself. We're happy to take questions. Uh, we'll have discussions afterwards. Thank you.
Nalini has a question. Hi, Greg. Thanks. This is Nalini Joshi. I have a question about the toy model you showed, which was um, the um, the loss function had two equal depth minima, right? Yeah. So yeah. In general, your loss functions are going to have multiple minima, which means that you are training models that might go to any of those minima. Yeah. And the question is, how does does that imply that? For example, when you're shooting for the moon, that you might land on another moon, uh, so to speak. So uh -huh. you have multiple answers coming out of your models or your training processes. And how do you reconcile them? Yeah. Uh, yeah, very good question. So, um, yeah, definitely in general, you know, like if you like zoom out, uh, when you only have a finite amount of data, right? And you try to fit that data, then like there can be many, many different ways to kind of complete the sequence in, in some sense, right? Like to to extrapolate uh, predictions to things that you haven't seen before. And you can, for example, a very bad way of doing things is you just memorize uh, what's in your data, and then you'll get zero training loss. But uh, when you try to extrapolate outside of data, you just always return zero, right? And that's obviously a very uninteresting way of learning things from data. You want to, roughly speaking, like extract, like complete the sequence or extrapolate what's in your training data in like the most uh, natural way in some in some uh, metric. Of course, like this is not really well defined in general, um, but you know, like. Concretely, you know, like we, uh, the, the these language models are able to learn like general reasoning capabilities, uh, from you know reading human text, and that is something that you want. Um, but in general, like the kind of like learning from uh, a finite amount of data and being able to extrapolate the correct thing, this is part science and part art. Uh, and fortunately, over the course of the last few decades. We've learned like good amount of tricks and some signs of the tricks to be able to extrapolate in the correct way, in the way that we care about, like the, like human society cares about. Um, and you know, like so, you know, just throwing out some things out there like dropout, uh, regularization te techniques like dropout, weight decay, uh, also like cleaning your data. Cleaning your data uh, is is very very important. Um, the model architecture, like convolutional neural networks, uh, being like a very good architecture to learn like image patterns, like natural patterns from natural image versus, you know, like maybe like, um, if you, if you represent things in Fourier basis, like represent images in Fourier basis, then the convolutions will be much less, uh, capable. So, um, yeah, so maybe like to more directly answer your question. There are essentially like our modern systems are built using all the wisdoms that we've learned over the last few decades so that when you land in one of the basins, it's almost always a case that you will give you like is is in the right basin in some sense. In some so somehow like all the wisdoms that we built up is able to avoid uh basins that we don't care about. And this is, you know, very interesting story. It has a long history. Still has a lot of mysteries associated with it. Um, that you know, like I think people will have a lot of fun trying to explore. Uh, and still, still, people are exploring this question quite a lot. Thanks, Greg. Can Can you see? There's a question of Kevin in the chat. Uh, let's see, Kevin. Okay, I had a simple question in libraries. Like PyTorch, we init params using Gaussian zero sigma square, where sigma square equals C over fan in plus fan out. Is your framework basically telling us how to change C as the network gets wider with fan in and fan out constant? Is this what you mean by parameterization? Yeah, so in some sense, that's correct. Yeah, so like one way, another way you can think about this is that when you can always you can always represent you can always choose coordinate system to represent any 
uh, hyperparameters. So in PyTorch, they chose a particular parameterization, a particular coordinate system to describe the variance. So they they square in terms of uh, fan in plus fan out, right? And um, so so yeah, you can use this, this coordinate system, and then what MuP tells you is how do you scale your number in this coordinate system so that the optimal hyperparameters don't change. Uh, sorry, the, 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 sorry, the optimal, you always achieve optimal performance as you scale. Another way of looking at this is, you know, MuP essentially also tells you how do you, what's the right coordinate system so that the optimal hyperparameter does not need to change, right? So, but anyway, so so essentially the, the answer to your question is yes. Okay, so Sadia has a question. This this width larger the better is only for first layer. No, the the is for every hidden layer. Any hidden layer works. Dino has a question. Thanks for a great talk. Could you comment on whether two wish extend these skin loss apply to regularization hyperparameters? Yeah, so a very good question. So everything I, I talk about here, you can you should think of the prototypical uh situation here as large scale pre-training of large neural network on enormous amount of data. So in these scenarios, the only thing you care about is optimizing the loss as fast as possible because you're really not gonna overfit on the enormous amount of uh, internet data. Hyperparameters, essentially they're not that useful for pre-training. However, they are useful uh, when you talk about fine tuning your large pre-training model on some downstream task where you have small amount of data. So then like these regularization can potentially uh, dramatically improve your performance by like not overfitting too much on the data. So in these scenarios, mu p is like half the answer, but you have another half which comes from, which which needs to account for how should the regularization uh, changes, the model size changes. Uh, so in short, like what I'm talking about here is should be considered only for how you scale model hyperparameters when you care only about training loss. So it does not talk anything about overfitting. And you can see from the, you know, the the equations of mu p that you will doesn't you cannot expect it to uh scale regularization correctly because regularization is kind of like it, it, the the right amount of regularization depends on both the model size and the and then the training data. Right? If you have a large amount of data you don't need regularization. If you have a small amount of data, you probably do need regularization. But like the, the way you scale hyperparameters here obviously does not depend on the amount of data you have. So you cannot really expect it to uh, actually uh, be able to scale regularization hyperparameters correctly. Uh, but but it's possible for you to combine mu p with another scaling rule that takes into account like the data size or other uh, variables in play to scale a regularization hyperparameters correctly. Thanks, Heath, Greg. Uh, there was a question from Cleo earlier on, basically discussing kind of how can you tell what these limits are? Yeah, I, so yeah, I can definitely talk about this. So this this kind of goes over this picture that I skipped earlier. So essentially uh, the answers you can, Yes, yeah, so you can essentially identify which one is optimal, which one is suboptimal by just looking at it. Because essentially, like the picture at this point is discrete because of this zero one law behavior, where when you take width to infinity, these random systems actually uh, become deterministic and have like a very discrete property. So, again, this picture is a character of the high dimensional space of all possible infinite width limits you can achieve. So, infinite width new networks. Uh, you can get, um, and uh, you know, to, to visualize this, I I kind of compress it into a two dimensional picture, but overall it gets the point across. And the point here is that, for most, essentially, like if you throw a random dart in the space, you're gonna get something uninteresting, like unstable or trivial, which means training blows up or training gets stuck in initialization. And then there, but but there actually there is an island in the middle. Uh, that does more interesting things. Um, so, so in this island, like the training is is okay. It doesn't blow up. It doesn't get stuck in initialization. And 
somehow like most of the points in this island belong to this so-called kernel regime. And what this means is that the neural network in the infinite width limit, uh, in any of the infinite width limit def de defined by the points in in uh, this interior of this island and this lower border here, it will have the property that the function represented by this network will evolve in a very simple manner mathematically. You will evolve in by this kind of uh, simple equation. Uh, essentially, the change due to one step of gradient descent is proportional to some kernel times the loss derivative of f. So in particular, if L, the loss, is a square loss, then this is literally a linear equation, linear evolution equation, which you know is like the, the baby version of all dynamical systems, and we all know how to solve this. So this is really, really attractive from a mathematical perspective because you can, you can say so much about it, uh, it's easy. You can solve this analytically, um, and so you, this is so much you can say about this. But tragically, it doesn't actually have the thing we want in neural networks, which is feature learning. So feature learning is this capability of, like you know, like a, a, a convolutional neural network learning what a face is, because you can see that there's like a neuron in in the middle of the network that lights up when there's a face in the picture. And it doesn't light up. It doesn't light up when there's no face in the picture, right? So this is feature learning because that neuron wasn't there to begin with. It wasn't there in the beginning when you randomly sample the weights. It was there only at the end. So that's what's called feature learning, right? It learns relevant things in in the data. But in this current regime where you have this seductive, beautiful equation of linear evolution, you don't have this capability. So this turns out to be a siren. Like it's kind of actually the wrong thing to look at. Now, fortunately, if you squint very close, the upper border of this island actually contains all the limits we care about. It actually does uh, what we want, the, the this feature learning capability. And uh, if you squint even further, uh, this vertex in this island here, which corresponds to the infinite width limit of mu p. So this is the maximal update limit. And this is special because it performs a feature learning and maximally roughly in the sense that like if any layer can do feature learning any any weights you know any layer of the neural network can do feature learning then in this limit uh you can that layer will retain this capability whereas you know if you pick a point off of this vertex then like for example the first layer will be stuck initialization it doesn't learn anything so it doesn't contribute to the learned function even though like the second layer, the third layer will learn features. So the, the network as a whole still learns features, but just the first layer is not you know doing its job, right? So that's an example of non-maximal feature learning limit, but the maximal update limit is the unique one that learns features in the maximal way, right? Okay, so to come back to your question, can you identify the different behaviors by looking at them? Can you identify which one is optimal by looking at them? Essentially, the answer is yes, right? Like you can see that this picture perfectly fractured in, into like these small number of discrete regions where we know exactly how they behave. And it's also very obvious that like there's like one limit that's uniquely optimal and everything else is kind of defective. Thanks enormously, Greg. Sounds good. Thank you.